And welcome back, folks, to the afternoon session here at the Law and Crime Network. I'm Michael Bryant. We all remember the case just fresh off the network here, Arizona versus Ramon Bueno, in which the defendant was accused of uh, eight counts, ultimately made, it, ultimately made it to the jury, involving victim James Casey, the state trooper out of Arizona, being shot in a uh, roadside routine traffic stop that uh, rapidly spiraled out of control. He was shot in the face, underwent 17-plus uh, procedures, surgeries to get himself back to as near normal as possible following the events of October 8, 2014. And uh, the trial went forward last week, ultimately guilty verdicts in seven of the eight counts. The one count remaining an 11 to 1 deadlock, 11 to 1 for guilt on the aggravated attempted murder charge. That didn't happen. Now the defendant, Ramon Bueno, awaits sentencing. That's coming up in January. The prosecution has some uh, maneuvering they need to do in preparation for that. But technically, about 160 years potential sentence on the table. So I have the pleasure now of talking with Trooper James Casey, who was not only the subject of that case, but uh, really a miracle in the minds of many. Trooper Casey, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. You know, as you look at this case, this should be a murder case, but for the miracle that is your survival. Do you feel like, you know, you, you, you benefited from a miracle? I do. I do. Um, from talking with the doctors and uh, just going through everything, it's amazing that I am here. Um, you know, Dr. Burrow, the oral maxillofacial surgeon who did my uh, initial surgery, um, he showed me that bullet just missed the carotid artery by just the end of a, uh, your thumbnail. So, yeah, it's a miracle I'm here. So let me ask you this. Uh, you know, you sat there going through this trial five years in the making from when the events took place. Were you apprehensive? Were you anxious? Did you want to get up there and tell your story? How were you feeling? Um, well, before I was, I tell you, I was geared up, ready to go for it. And then as the days got closer, the nerves crept in. Um, you know, and then once it started, the uh, trial actually started, uh, as I said to the jury, uh, some of that stuff that uh, Trooper Ray Cruz talked about, I ha I'd never heard that before. And um, I, I don't know how much you caught in the aggravation phase, but I, I told the jury, um, I always wondered when I went back why Ray would look, Trooper Cruz would look at me, you know, when I make traffic stops close to that area. And, uh, you know, and now I know, <laughs> you know. Everything yeah. you went through to save my life. And let's talk about that. You went back to work about a year after this happened. And then in April of 2018, you had another event. Tell us about that. Uh, that night, it was, uh, I had a, I, I drove an unmarked charger. So I had what they considered a UC undercover car. And uh, they, uh, Phoenix police, they were pursuing, or not pursuing, but they were um, tailing a guy who had been involved in a shooting. I believe he might have murdered somebody. He was involved in a carjacking. Well, his phone was in the vehicle, and uh, the helicopter is tracking his vehicle from the phone. Anyhow, I got behind it, and we went over the 101 onto the 202 in Tempe. Well, when uh, his name was Andre Rippey, and when he, one of our troopers set up spikes at the bottom of the ramp, well, when Andre tried to swerve and oh, to avoid the spikes, he wound up crashing into a lady, and uh, they went to the side of the freeway. Well, I watched it as I was coming down the ramp. Now, mind you, there's nobody behind me because they wanted everybody backed off. And uh, I watched him get out of the car. He started pounding on her window, and then I saw him pull a gun out. And she took off, and then he started running at me with the gun. And, I, I mean, the only thing I had time to react was I turned, slanted my body so my chest would catch it, and I pulled my gun. But luckily, two Phoenix cops, they came out of nowhere, and, uh, you know, they saved me from another shooting. Yeah, that had to be so, a, a sobering moment there. And then uh, nobody would blame you. You retired soon after that. And, and at the time of this trial, you, were, in fact, were retired. Let's talk about the one lone juror that seemed to, to hang up on this first count of attempted aggravated murder. Um, as you're sitting there, you're watching the jurors. You, you have that advantage that we here at the network and those viewers watching don't get. You get to kind of size them up. Did you get a sense that there was some discord between one or others of the jury members as you were watching the trial unfold? No, not really. They all seem to, you know, they were, I mean, they asked a lot of questions. Uh, you know, they, they seem to really pay attention. And, you know, um, so I, I didn't really see any discourse from any of the jurors. And, um, you know, 
so yeah, no, it, it's kind of hard. Uh, you know, I was you couldn't surprised. read their their poker faces. You couldn't read them there. I get that. No, no, no. And I usually, I trust me, I do try to read poker faces too. Yeah. So as you're as you're uh, sitting there listening to this, and during deliberations, when the jury members ask for the uh, witness Sunderland's testimony to be reread so they can refresh their recollection on that, you had to start thinking they, they got an issue with ID. They got an issue with whether or not I could actually ID Ramon Bueno. Was that your sense? Um. No, honestly, I, I the William Sunderland requesting that testimony again was a little um I, I was surprised by that because uh, he talked about watching me involved in the shooting, and I never had a chance to draw my weapon, and I mean that was that was stated numerous times from the different Phoenix detectives and experts that my my weapon was never pulled, um, I never fired around, so um, that that was kind of um, I, I was shocked about that. I you know he didn't. You know, I, I, was, I, I didn't understand that. One. I was a bit surprised that they, uh, the prosecution used him to the extent that they did because he really did create an issue that was not supported by any other evidence. There was no other evidence anywhere that all three officers, including yourself, was firing when this altercation began. But that certainly confused this jury. And one of the other issues they might have had was uh, on the ID front. You're at the car. You're at the back driver's side uh, passenger window, correct? and you're leaning in, what exactly are you looking at just at the time the shot is fired? All right, well, you know, as I explained, as I explained to the jury, and, um, and I guess I can go through it, um, I, I, the, just, so, just so I'll go through the car. Lori Richardson had her hands on a steering wheel. Vanessa Martinez had both her hands on her thighs, you know, on her legs. Ramon Bueno had his left hand on his left thigh. He had his right hand under a right blanket. Valeria Jaime was wrapped up in a blanket, and she had it like this, you know, if I'm, you know, so I could see her hands. And Danny Vargas, as I showed the jury, he was laying on his hands and his arms. Um, when I never saw, I never saw, I mean, he never pulled, Ramon never pulled the gun. Because um, I, I, as I said to the, in a testimony, I had been asked that question in an internal investigation, you know, um, did you see the gun? And I said, no, he's fired it from under that blanket. And I guess where I know one of the questions was, how was I sure Valeria didn't shoot or how was I sure Danny didn't shoot? Well, the two reasons I would say that well, one is because, you know, I can account for their hands. And two, I believe it was uh, Mike Bedow, the detect or the firearms expert. He said that gun was a six inch 357 barrel, uh, 357 caliber of six inch barrel. Um, I would have seen that you know, Valeria hiding it, she would have never been able to hide it under that blanket. And Danny, I mean, that gun would have been as plain as day if he was holding it. So, you know. So it really sounds like and the jury bought on to this, except for that one juror, that it was really a process of elimination and assumption that I could account for everything else going on. Therefore, it must have been bueno. Sure. And, and you know what? It, I mean, literally, there. I mean, you know, no pun intended, but there is no smoking gun. And I think that's what that juror got hung up on. Yeah, and I pointed out, too, when we were covering this, that, you know, uh, credit to you for telling the story as you know it and recall it. But the fact is, Trooper, you could have lied. You know, you could have said, hey, I saw his face, I saw the gun, I saw it all happen. And there really would have been no contradiction. But I'm glad you didn't do that because that wasn't the story and that isn't what you perceived. Let me ask you yeah. this as we move towards sentencing. Uh, what do you want? What do you expect? Um, well, you know, I, I'm going to read. I would never expect anything, but I, I would, you know what, if, if the, uh, I think if the, the maximum, because of uh, Ramon's in that area of, um, the aggravated assault, um, because he got the gang enhancing. So it adds five years to each sentence. So he would be in the 20.75 to 40 year range per charge. So honestly, if uh, judge Fisk, if she maxed and stacked him and gave him, you know, 40 can you know, three forty consecutives, 120 total, I would be more than happy. Um, as I said, uh, you know, Ramon's a very dangerous man. Um, you know, he, you know, he, he needs to die in prison. You know? So uh, yeah, I, get I, the, I get the feeling he's going to be uh, a handful in prison as well. But if it plays out like you suggest, that top count may ultimately have less impact if he's given enough years for all the seven counts for which he was convicted. So let me ask you a very important question. How's the family? What are you doing for the holidays? What's the plan this week? 
Oh, good, good. We're all doing good. Uh, my youngest son, Brandon, he just arrived in town yesterday. So as soon as we're done with this, we're heading out shopping. Well, doing that last minute Christmas. There shopping. you go. That's the spirit. Yeah. Well, I'm sure the family is very glad to have you around for the last few Christmases and who knows how many going forward. Trooper, Casey, I appreciate your time. Uh, everybody, big fans from you uh, and the work on uh, Live PD, as well as uh, the unfolding of your story on the network here at Long Crime. Appreciate it, sir. Oh, well, I appreciate it. And tell you know, everybody and the fans, I miss them all. So now you can talk, you know, right? Yeah. Now, now you can chat with people, right? Yeah, you, were, you, yeah. you had to kind of keep a low like profile, but now you can get out there. Yeah, yeah. I, and then, you know what? This weekend, I had to, this weekend was great. I had to just get away from it all, just a few days, just to decompress. So it was good, you yeah. know. Good for you, sir. Again, thank you so much. Have a great holiday or two and uh, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Have a good day. Have you a good bet. holiday. You too. Thank Thanks. you. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. We're coming back. We'll jump back into the Ashley MacArthur case out of Florida. This is the Long Crime Network.